So um, my definition of slip velocity is is that quantity. Okay. Yes. Okay, yes, um, so two things about that. So ignoring advection, I'm starting my argument from this equation, right? I'm saying there's a surface and there is this profile of very strong, uh, so if this is Z, this is my W of Z, very strongly uh, changing or rapidly changing interactions uh, over the range of sigma typically, uh, which is let's say two angstrom or of order, order one angstrom. Uh, in this region, I'm looking at quantities such as pressure density um, and basically this uh, body force which uh, appeared in the form of a derivative. So what I'm saying is all these quantities that depend on the very strongly varying uh, function should be singular. I expect them to be singular and anything which doesn't depend on that I expect it to be smooth uh, from a mathematical sense. There is no physics here. Okay. Now I look at this equation, Laplacian of something, that second derivative has to be zero, so what comes in has to be a smooth function, and I don't see any divergence of f in there. So now I'm saying I have a smooth function which I have to somehow match in this region of, of one angstrom. I expect that the changes I get in t minus kt rho will be small over this range. Uh, so that means if I'm comparing this quantity in this layer, with the same quantity on another layer, I expect to see very small changes. Now I switch on the physics argument and I say I recognize this as something that looks like the combination of hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure, so maybe this is really stress balance equation uh, in a very loose sense um, that I'm basically imposing on my, my fluid layer. So I'm saying stress which this lower surface is experiencing, T minus KT rho, down here should balance with the stress that the top layer is experiencing so that the fluid which is inside is at equilibrium. This is a physical argument. Um, the link to that mathematical argument and basically the final, um, if you want machinery to make it rigorous, will come through the calculations that I do today. But for now, I wanted you to have these um, physical arguments and also to be able to read things in, uh, in equations when we're dealing with really a very specific behavior which is singular near the surface. Okay? Sure. Um, yes, uh, so that's basically um, I mean, what KT Rho is doing here is it's is bringing in something about the the force which uh, which comes from. So the body force, basically. I mean, this this layer is not really uh, without interactions. It's experiencing in this layer the interaction with the surface that comes through that. I took away that part, and what remains was a smooth part. Uh, let's say. Uh, however, this is. This is really hiding a lot of things because P has a part which is not smooth and Rho has a part which is not smooth. I'm saying it's the combination of the two which is smooth. Um, so really this is, this is not a rigorous argument. I'm, I'm, uh, I guess what I'm trying to do is make connection with what people have in mind as osmotic pressure because one way to deal with this is to say forget about osmotic pressure. You, you don't need to use it and I think people will feel uncomfortable with that. Uh, this is a remedy. I'm saying this looks like an osmotic pressure which is sitting next to the other pressure. Uh, 
And we expect, because of this equation, that the combination of the two should be a smooth function layer by layer. Exactly, and, and that's what we did when we started from the, the Stokes equation. Yeah. So I, my preference is to not think about osmotic pressure at all and basically just uh, look at the maths. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Right. So, um, did you press the, yes, thank you. So let's go back to the question of diffuse euphoresis and try to make it uh, uh, more clear in terms of where it's coming from. And basically the idea would be to derive an expression uh, which doesn't depend on hand-waving arguments and approximations and then see exactly uh, how the arguments we had fit with the, uh, with the real calculation. So the situation again is as follows. I have a big particle, a colloidal particle, which is sitting in the uh, solution where I'm maintaining a concentration gradient. Um, let's call the solute uh, B molecules and let's call the colloid um, A molecule or, or A uh, component. Um, then what I would like to do is I would like to focus on the interaction between uh, B molecules with, with the colloid. Um, assuming that the solution is always in the dilute condition. So the quantity of interest uh, from, a, uh, from the point of view of, uh, of the stochastic dynamics will be basically um, define a coordinate system so suppose this is my origin um, will be the two body uh, distribution which is the probability of finding a colloidal particle at position R and the uh, a solute particle at position X um, as a function of time. Okay, so this is a pair correlation function and I want to write a stochastic equation for that and solve it and see what I get. Focusing on this quantity means I'm ignoring uh, two body interactions between the B particles. So uh, I'm allowed to do that if I assume that the B solution is dilute and also I'm ignoring interactions between A particles which is again valid approximation when uh, the colloidal solution is dilute so I don't care about A's interacting with A's at the moment I'm just essentially focusing on this complex for now okay So the equation that I can write for this is the Fokker-Planck equation. For the two body interactions, let's assume that um, these two interact with each other with, a, uh, with an interaction potential, which I call WAB. This could have different features, attractive part, uh, repulsive part, and so on. Um, and I'm assuming it will depend on the distance between them. Uh, essentially, that means that the two will have a force dipole acting on each other, so a pair of, say, attractive or repulsive forces acting on each other, and I need to take those into account in, in my Fokker-Planck equation. So what are the elements I need to put? Uh, here, essentially, uh, a Fokker-Planck equation <coughs> 
Um, writing it in this notation. is typically of this form, so time derivative of the density uh, will be minus divergence of, of the relevant flux. Uh, here I have a two-body problem, so I will have fluxes uh, uh, basically originating from individual particles, and uh, I need to add them one by one. Um, so there will be a term. A particle which is basically made of uh, divergence of this mobility uh, times essentially a force or a generalized thermodynamic force if you want made of a diffusive component uh, which comes from the stochastic fluctuations and a drift component which has gradient of the interaction both of these terms have minus signs so diffusive flux is minus d grad rho and force is minus grad uh, W, and they cancel with this extra minus that I have here, right? So this is um, something you would uh, normally write if you were to write a single particle uh, of your Planck equation, and this mu AA means the mobility um, giving you the velocity of particle A when you're looking at the force which is exerted on particle A. Right, so mobility always relates a force to a velocity. Then I have another term very similar to that for the B particle. Okay, so I just use uh, x, which is the coordinate for the B particle, and the mobility is mu BB. Then I need to incorporate the cross terms as well, because if I have a force which is exerted on particle B, and that is a force due to this interaction W, that will cause a velocity, a drift velocity for particle A. And if I have a force which is acting on particle A, that will cause a drift velocity for particle B. And the relevant mobilities will be cross terms, so um, off-diagonal terms in the mobility tensor. So that will be This is the first term. The flux is the B flux. Um, and this divergence is the A divergence. And the mu is cross mu, right? Mu AB. And then I have Okay, this is my full Fokker-Planck equation for the two-particle correlation function. 
Any questions? Yes. Uh, so the mobility matrices are basically representing the fluid dynamics because um, so this will be clear in the moment when I when I write expressions for that here. And if you if you look at this structure, it is designed such that the system will equilibrate no matter what hydrodynamic or otherwise uh, related mobility expression I have. It will always give you Boltzmann weight when you set the interior of the uh, uh, the flux expression to zero. And that's the statement that you will always equilibrate or go to thermodynamic equilibrium no matter what uh, dynamics you have, no matter what uh, whether you have hydrodynamic interactions or not. This is basically how you, you construct the Fokker-Planck equation. Okay, yes? Y yes. Um, so I want to explain this a bit more when I give expressions for these mobilities, but basically if you have two uh, particles, um, let's say this is A and this is B, um, so VA equals mu AA times FA. Okay, this is the meaning of mu AA. And the same for B. But when you have a force which is exerted at this point in space, there will be a hydrodynamic flow which will advect this particle, right? So then I will need to add and in fact there is a relation between these because these are Green's functions of Stokes equation and uh, you can prove that mu AB is equal to mu BA transverse. It's basically a uh, property of Green's function that you can uh, take the transpose and uh, switch the positions. It's, it's basically on Zogger relations as well. Yes, yes. Okay. Right. So what am I interested in? Uh, not really the correlation function, I'm interested in the single particle Fokker-Planck equation for A particles. And the way to get that is to integrate this equation over X, and then if you integrate the two-body uh, correlation function, you get a one-body correlation function or density, which is uh, essentially rho A. So I'll do that. Um, So I integrate that over x, um, and you will see immediately that this term will die, and this term will die. Um, and I will use this definition basically if you want uh, the density of the A particles is the integral of uh, the two body correlation function um, so then what I obtain <coughs> 
now I have some room, so I will remind us that these mobilities in general are functions of these positions. Right. Um, so now I simplify this expression by assuming that the B particles are basically molecular in scale. So if you think about point-like particles, then you can uh, convince yourself that mu AA um, will not depend on X. In fact, if you assume that you have a bulk solution with no boundaries, around, uh, then mu AA will just be a constant. Uh, why is that? Because when you want to calculate um, self-mobilities or self-friction coefficients um, in suspensions, essentially um, the correction that you will get to single particle uh, mobility or friction coefficient will be proportional to the hydrodynamic influence of uh, the other molecules in the solution. I've assumed that basically I have a dilute solution of the A particles, so the A's don't see each other uh, that often, and the B's that see um, the A particles are point-like, so the influence will be um, infinitely small. Um, and that means I can take this quantity out of the integral and simplify the first term. So I'll do that. Actually, I'll put the KT out. And then um, let me write the new form of the second term, and then I'll explain what I have done to get this. So to get this, I have used the following expression. So uh, because my interaction is a function of the difference, gradient with respect to R is the same as minus gradient with respect to X. Um, so I write this term. So first of all, this term is done. I'm writing it here. There is no x-integration, right? The second term 
I write del R as minus del X, um, and essentially I bring it down here together with that, and I write my mobility as mu A B minus mu A A. That's also fine, right? The only thing which is not fine is by writing it like that, I introduce an additional term with the del X, which is minus mu A A del X. That didn't exist up here, but because mu AA is a constant, that in fact is a, um, is a surface term because it's integral over divergence. So I'm allowed to, um, to rewrite this expression if I don't have any boundaries. Okay, let's look at it for a few seconds. You're all happy? Uh, the time dependence is still there. Strong as ever. Thank you. So this is fine. Yes? Yes. Um, so what is mu A A again? It's I exert a force on A, I get a velocity for A. If A is a single particle with no uh, interactions with the others, this would be basically a constant. So uh, Stokes friction. Uh, if I introduce additional particles, uh, there will be a hydrodynamic interaction, but that hydrodynamic interaction will be proportional to the size of these particles. If I assume that B particles are point-like, so molecules, if I'm thinking of a it will be the response, the velocity that you get um, for a particle when you exert a force on the a particle, right? So it's the diagonal term of the mobility matrix. And that will depend on the presence of other particles. So if I have a dense solution, if I have a solution like that, okay, and if I take this particle exert a force on it and measure the velocity, that will not be Stokes friction because I have all these other particles, very big particles close by, so there will be corrections of the order of the size of this divided by the distance, which is like 20%, something like that, and then you have to add them up. It's a many-body interaction, in fact, so it's, it's, it's complicated. It will give you something which is different from that constant will depend on the position, on the position of the other ones, and so on, right? So here I'm assuming that this particle is a point. I'm thinking of a solution of sugar or, or some, some molecular species, so angstrom in size compared to a micron, so I can ignore them, okay? These two. Um, so these two are both here. I just, I just changed the derivative from one because WAB is in fact a function of the separation. Yeah, so let me actually write this because I... I think it's helpful to have it. Yes, thank you. Ah, there's a square bracket missing. Sorry. Yes, of course. Thank you. Okay, good. So, this is all good? Right. Um, so, now I have the makings of something which will, uh, which will start to look familiar soon, but still it doesn't really look like that. I have uh, what you typically get when you start working with these many-body um, correlation functions, something that looks like a hierarchy, an equation for the single particle species depends still on the two-particle uh, distribution function. And if I, s I am naive and I say, okay, no problem, I'll write an equation for the three-particle distribution and integrate it to get something for the two-particle, I will have to do this forever because there is never going to be uh, a closure unless I impose it myself. Uh, somehow, and this is typically done uh, 
as an approximation, uh, which will basically be um, a mean field approximation. So in order to close the equation, I will need to use a closure uh, so-called closure scheme and the uh, easiest most physically intuitive way of uh, connecting the two-body correlation function to the one-body correlation functions in this system is to assume uh, that the two-body correlation function is basically proportional to the probability of finding an A particle at position R, the probability of finding a B particle at position X, and essentially this Boltzmann weight, which tells you about how likely it is for them to get close to one another. If they hate each other, W is very strongly repulsive. Those two probabilities will not know about this, the single particle ones, and you have to add this by hand. Uh, so this is essentially something that comes from, uh, from the physics. All of liquid state theory has been done like this in the past 100 years. Um, it has worked. Um, so people are typically happy with these uh, closure schemes. The only place that they break down is close to critical points where you have critical fluctuations. Essentially, mean field theory will break down. So this is equivalent to having a mean field uh, description of this system. OK, so when I do this, then life becomes much easier because now I will uh, plug this in and I will have uh, essentially uh, the two components, X and R components, um, separating from one another. So this is what we get after we insert that um, closure equation. Basically, the trick is for this grad uh, W to cancel because of the exponential term. So it's constructed such that you get rid of uh, this term and you basically just uh, clean up what you have from the grad X. Um, grad X is only now sitting on row B because that's the only X-dependent uh, density which is left. Um, you still have the mobilities which will depend on x, so the x integration will need to be done. There is a Boltzmann weight, and then the a density is just outside. So what you start to see here is has the making of a drift velocity because you have some really big expression multiplying rho a of r. Okay, and that drift velocity happens to have gradient of rho b, which is what we like. We want to have a foretic term out of it. But we are not home yet, because I need to derive the expression that we had yesterday. So let's do that. <coughs> 
okay I want to simplify this one more time um, and in order to do that uh, let me write the expression uh, and then tell you how I got it Okay, so what happened was uh, basically I added and subtracted the minus one from the Boltzmann weight. Uh, I'm allowed to do that because, so the subtraction is here and the other term that I have will uh, be cancelled because then I can integrate x by part and put this divergence on mu a a and mu a b from the right. Uh, mu a is a constant so that would be zero and for mu a b that will also be zero because my mobility uh, tensor components are all uh, divergence free because of the incompressibility of the Stokes uh, hydrodynamics so when I'm solving for the Green's function of Stokes equation I always have something that looks like that and when I take the divergence of my velocity it should always be zero which means my Green's functions or my mobilities should always be divergence free um, and this is the case when you apply the divergence uh, from the left on mu a b but it's also the case when you apply it from the right because mu a b is mu b a transverse so what I have as divergence acting from the right times mu a b is in fact divergence of mu b a as a whole transverse. So zero transverse is zero again. So I'm allowed to simplify this like that and now I think you can relax a little bit more because we are closer to, um, to the expression we want and um, I think I'd like to keep that so I will probably Yes. Uh, say it again, please. W is zero. Okay. Uh, why should it be? this one uh, then the, the the expression for the drift velocity will be zero yes here it's not non-zero because you can integrate by part this X and this is exactly what I was looking at right now so then this will act on dub mu a a which is a constant that will give you zero and it will act on mu a b which will be divergence of a mobility so that's zero as well I'm really writing it this way for convenience uh, because the, the information is there if you write it that way but this will give us the right form for, for the formula that we had yesterday uh, from Deryagin. Okay, we're almost there. 
So let me keep this expression. And by now you have basically, uh, well, let me write it actually this way. Uh, so the equation I have is essentially uh, is essentially a drift diffusion equation. Um, where D is KBT times mu, as you expect, and the drift velocity is minus KBT all that right so now we need to integrate over x and for that we need to know this function mu a b as it depends on basically r and x how do we get that essentially the uh, blueprint is here i need to look at the uh, green's functions of my stokes equation um, and essentially so the self mobility term is very easy um, for a sphere mu a a and again, in the approximation that B particles are point-like, if my uh, A particle is a sphere uh, of radius A, oh, I have it here, Uh, then mu a a is simply one over Stokes friction uh, and the identity matrix, and then mu a b uh, believe it or not, we know it already. Uh, I will write the expression and give you a few seconds to guess where we know it from, and then uh, we will discuss it. So here's the expression. So ER is the radial unit vector. Um, A is the radius and R is the distance between, uh, so R is this distance actually. So what I'm saying is, if I exert a force here, the velocity of the sphere will be given by that, which looks very much 
the same as Stokes solution. Uh, when you take a sphere and drag it with the force F, what is the velocity at a given point? Why are these two the same? Because mu a b is equal to mu b a transpose. So when I want to calculate the velocity of my sphere when I exert a point force somewhere in the bulk, it's the same as exerting a force on the sphere and calculating the velocity somewhere in the bulk. And that solution I already have. Okay, is this clear? Yes, so I have these expressions, I subtract them, I will plug them in, I will integrate, and let's see what we get. Hopefully we'll get something we recognize. Otherwise you'll kick me out, I think. Okay, so I'll write the difference down here. Okay, so probably it's clear, if you look at this, it's clear that um, it's a, it was a good idea to subtract mu a a because now these expressions, both of them will vanish when r is equal to a, um, and that's what you basically expect. Um, essentially, when the particle is touching the surface, that dipole, which is the pair of forces interacting uh, between the two particles, should not be allowed to contribute uh, and uh, basically in general this would be your result when you put this there. Um, this is not limited to uh, short range interactions but to check that we uh, have essentially the same expression as before let's just look at that uh, particular case. So let's assume that we are looking at distances uh, that are, so if this is r, I will write uh, r as a plus delta, and I'm looking at cases where delta is much smaller than a. Uh, in this case, I can Taylor expand these two uh, hydrodynamic factors. So This one I'll call uh, square with one dot, and this one will be two dots. So this one is minus one, three quarter. be 
Okay. So then mu a b minus mu a a will be approximately that expression of order delta. So as you notice, only the transverse component survives or the delta, or the delta squared, there'll be transverse and radial components, yes? Um, so I'm talking about the B particle. Um, uh, yes, so if you think of a sugar molecule, the size of it is angstromish, and if the particle is, uh, yes, I mean, strictly speaking, where the interaction, which is W, is appreciable, uh, the size is also appreciable, um, so there will be corrections to this. But as any analytical theory, you basically start with the easiest thing, and then you add uh, correction. It's not difficult to do this calculation uh, for this case. Uh, there are exact solutions. Um, you go to double spherical, bispherical coordinates and so on. Uh, I didn't want to do that here. I think you, you are happy that I didn't. Uh, but basically, yes, we can do that. Okay, so this is an important observation that at the lowest order, only the transverse component uh, survives. Um, and then if I plug this in, So now, because I've expanded near the surface, this gradient, which otherwise was basically uh, a function of x in the vicinity of the A particle, is now sitting on the surface of the sphere. I'm just integrating over the polar angle, uh, the solid angle. Um, I've uh, used this projection uh, operator, which basically means I'm only projecting onto the transverse direction. So this is as we called it exactly the same as we called it yesterday. Um, this integral was one of the exercises to show that this is equal to the gradient of rho b at infinity. So if you write a solution to Poisson equation and incorporate no um, uh, uh, basically flux, normal flux, um, you will calculate this integral. You get the value of gradient uh, at infinity. And this is basically what we called yesterday uh, the Jagen length um, and essentially uh, we derive this expression uh, where mu is same as before so uh, essentially this is the expression that we have when delta is much smaller than A. Uh, you have corrections already. You can calculate the 1 over A correction if you want. Uh, there will be a radial component uh, for that, uh, as well as uh, a transverse component. And uh, if you don't want to approximate, uh, you actually have the full expression, uh, which basically means that gradient not just on the surface uh, in the transverse direction, but in a, a, a zone nearby the particle, as long as the interaction range allows, will be taken into account when you calculate the drift velocity. Yes? Uh, 
Um, so the way this came about uh, is basically via uh, this expansion. So I'm saying R is A plus delta, and I expand everything in orders of delta. The lowest order that I'm getting from the hydrodynamic mobility is order delta. If I want to stop at order delta, my gradient needs to be uh, calculated at order delta to the zero, uh, so order constant, which basically means at R equals A. I can expand this uh, to second order, so if you're interested in delta squared, there will be a second derivative component coming from this, right? Yes. So that's basically what yesterday we called separation of uh, length scale or asymptotic expansion. Um, I am integrating delta to infinity, but really uh, this interaction is going to, so the reason I'm allowed to do that is because w is a very sharply picked function around zero, and then as soon as you go away a few angstroms, a w is zero, which means one minus one is zero. So I'm allowed to integrate. Basically, this is uh, this is asymptotic expansion, yeah, or asymptotic matching. It's in the same sense as we had yesterday. So we are really looking at uh, the the region where things are happening, and then uh, we're allowed to take this limit when there is not much happening. So yes. So I'm doing this calculation is the only place where I specified dimension. Uh, and this is the Green's function to Stokes equation in 3D for a sphere of radius r. Uh, you can change it, go to four dimensions uh, as we were yesterday, and do it in other geometries and so on. That's yes. Yes. Okay, so let's. Uh, this is an important point. Let's let's look at it again uh, and see what we are doing. So, what I'm looking at is the interaction of a B particle with an A particle, and this is the radius of my A particle, and this is basically delta, right? So the calculation up to here. Uh, allows this delta, so if I define R as A plus delta, allows delta to be small or large compared to A. There is no limitation. When I'm expanding and only keeping uh, terms of order delta over A, basically I'm just looking at this vicinity and I'm saying that the curvature is small. So uh, then it's only the transverse gradient which matters and then the approximation uh, that will be blowing this up into what we had yesterday essentially makes sense, right? Um, yes, um, so, well, I mean, this integral will tell you uh, in the sense that this mobility function is a bunch of algebraic uh, terms, so A over R, A over R cubed, and so on. Uh, you're integrating that, multiplying it by the gradient of uh, the solute everywhere, uh, and weighting that with exponential of uh, W minus 1. So when W dies, um, essentially, so suppose I have a situation where, where W um, from here onwards has this kind of behavior, let's say, so a range which is comparable to A, uh, then all across this region, that integral will have a contribution because e to the power minus W over kT minus 1 will be non-zero, and then you multiply that by all these factors, uh, and they will all contribute. Um, when W uh, has a range which is like that, 
right? So you're only integrating over that shell, and then the curvature is, is less important. So the simplest case that we dealt with yesterday was when essentially uh, I used this language of fourth dipoles, basically. Uh, so essentially you have molecules that are uh, involved with the, with the colloidal surface in these uh, force dipoles, and then if you uh, essentially come out of this region asymptotically and you're interested in what happens out here, you can replace all that uh, because this is a force-free system now outside of this, there, is no f uh, there are no forces that, that remain. Uh, you can replace all that by an asymptotic value of the velocity relative to the surface of the fluid, so that we call the slip velocity, which means out here we can solve for Stokes' equation and just incorporate some slip velocity boundary condition. Um, it is possible to get a rotation of the bigger particle. That will be what I talk about next, yes. Yes. Uh, I just went to the spherical coordinates, uh, uh, and because we are expanding, uh, essentially there is an A squared coming from the measure uh, if, you, if you look carefully in the results. So I have this A squared, and, and there was another one. Okay, so I really do want all of you to feel that you understand diffusiophoresis inside out, right? And if it's not the case, then still ask questions. Yes? Say it again. Uh, why didn't I expand this? Uh, well, so let's do that. Um, You get a second derivative, right? And a term which is proportional to delta first, and then higher order terms. Now, already I ignore delta squared terms. So I don't need to keep it for this one. But you can if you want to, if you want to calculate um, every contribution you have at the next order, at the order delta squared, you need to keep that as well. Well, you still have a chance. Yes, Julia. Um, um, I used a lot of things, for example, in compressibility and so on uh, throughout the derivation. So all along, I was dealing with hydrodynamic viscous Stokes hydrodynamic mobility coefficients. There is a point where you can you can develop it, and and there, there will be a point of departure from this calculation. But I don't think it's it's easy to use this expression and extrapolate and and say what would uh, what what if this was not hydrodynamics? Yes, yes. So I did that when you weren't here still, and and. Uh, uh, several times I use divergence equals zero conditions and so on. So all of those terms need to be kept if I'm in a gas. Yeah. Okay. So let me um, talk about rotation first, and then we'll go to something else. 
Um, so when we were talking about uh, basically relating what we had near a flat surface to the drift velocity of a spherical colloidal particle in a solution that has asymptotically a, a gradient, let's say a constant gradient. Uh, we used uh, Lorentz's uh, reciprocal theorem and essentially found out that the translational velocity is a surface average, let's say for a sphere, of the slip velocity. Uh, now the slip velocity being um, mu times uh, lateral gradient of rho. Uh, basically we can put this inside uh, and calculate an expression uh, for the velocity. I told you that I, I'm dealing with a case where mu is constant, so I'll just take it out, and then using a solution to Laplace equation, the integral of uh, a transverse component of the gradient on the surface comes out as the gradient itself at infinity. However, we don't have to do that, because uh, the physics that we developed. So here in this vicinity, uh, slip velocity being equal to mu times whatever grad rho is in that vicinity is local and is obtained by separation of length scale, which means that if my surface is covered somehow or structured, let's say I take a, uh, a surface and coat it uh, with different materials, uh, and let's remember uh, that mu is essentially some measure of the surface interaction between the colloid and the molecules, then essentially I can write this equation locally using the local value of mu. And the local value of mu could vary um, uh, along the sphere. Uh, in this case, um, even without that variation, I could calculate uh, translational velocity. Um, for angular velocity, it turns out uh, when you do the calculation, uh, using reciprocal theorem and basically relating torque and angular velocity the way we did yesterday with velocity, uh, translational velocity and force, uh, using Stokes solution, uh, we can write the following expression for the total angular velocity. Uh, this was basically meant to be one of the exercises, and you'll get the solution uh, in the notes today. Right, so now if I plug in my expression for uh, slip velocity for a, for a sphere, um, Let's say I'm looking at a case which is axially symmetric for simplicity. Um, then it turns out that when you do the calculation, if mu is uniform, omega will be zero. Um, and this is another uh, exercise that you can do. In fact, if mu of theta is decomposed into Legendre polynomial uh, components, then when you do the calculation in, in the case of a sphere, 
what controls the angular velocity if this axis of symmetry is called n um, is the first component of the mobility in Legendre harmonics uh, in other words for the slip velocity to be able to break the symmetry and rotate the particle somehow you need to have a polar symmetry breaking in the surface covering of your sphere right for example if you uh, asymmetrically coat this sphere let's say half of it with some metal which is different from the other half which is a plastic then the Hamike constant or the van der Waals interaction between metal and your molecule in the solution will be different from the same interaction between plastic and that molecule uh, and that will give you a non-zero mu one which will give you an angular velocity so if you have a uh, particle which is coated somehow uh, asymmetrically with the polar um, a symmetry um, and you place it in an external gradient uh, which is let's say in this direction changing notations all the time then the particle will align itself let's say away or towards the gradient depending on the sign of mu one whether it's positive or negative yeah. yes absolutely so uh, if you use uh, separation of length scale so if you use uh, situations where the range of interaction is always much smaller than the typical uh, scales of curvature that you have uh, you can always use this boundary condition implement it locally and then do the hydrodynamics correctly uh, by basically calculating the translational angular velocity for any geometry um, say you can do it for a, an ellipsoid so these are the geometries that have been looked at for a rod uh, pear-shaped uh, particles and so on uh, and you will obtain expressions uh, similar to that so translational velocity and angular velocity um, etc so this is for particles that are somehow structured passively and I place them in an externally generated gradient now here is the key uh, ingredient in our uh, calculation which allows us to go one step further uh, if you think about it there is nothing fundamentally special about the gradient being externally generated because the system is force free and that means if the system somehow has a mechanism uh, to generate the gradient itself it can um, use this mechanism it can use this mechanism to have translational velocity and angular velocity but then it will be via uh, self-generated gradients so you would call this uh, self-diffuse theophoresis so essentially because the particles are force free and torque free um, well yes the significance of the statement is I want to make a particle which is self-propelled uh, so there has to be some mechanism internally to drive the dynamics if I take a colloid and pull on it externally uh, I basically exert an external force um, if I have mechanical components that uh, create structure for example I have uh, a body and a flagellum and a motor that spins the flagellum and so on there will be a 
dynamical scheme in which conformational changes through the same kind of mobility terms that I introduced will couple hydrodynamics between the different parts and then the, the four aft asymmetry is going to generate uh, translational velocity. Here I want to use diffuse euphoresis, which is a mechanism um, that can be maintained internally and then via basically a force-free mechanism you will make something which is self-propelled. So you can call it a self-propelled particle or a, or a swimmer, but this one will not be just an arrow uh, on, a, on a sphere as many of the models that you see in the literature um, have. So this is really building a, a mechanism that can be implemented experimentally. So uh, just like before, if I assume that uh, Peclé number is small and ignore the advection, essentially what I need to do uh, to make a self-propelled particle or, uh, or a micro-swimmer Um, is basically solving the following equations. I will need to solve diffusion equation and in the limit of things happening slowly in the stationary state I can ignore the time dependence and then I will have, so this is my particle, uh, I will have some boundary condition where on the surface um, there is a normal flux So the surface will have some sort of structure such that at point Rs on the surface, let's say uh, there's a flux of particles coming out. Uh, so this could be a chemical reaction, uh, for example. Uh, there could be flux of particles coming in, turning into other particles going out. There could be all kinds of complicated things. Uh, for the purpose of writing the generic scheme, uh, you can just incorporate a source term here. Um, something that I will call uh, the activity coefficient and essentially this will measure the non-equilibrium activity of the system. It will be the rate at which you introduce say catalytic activities and so on. It's just the normal flux of, of the molecule. We could have several species and so on. Uh, and then because Peclé number is small I don't have to couple this to hydrodynamics. I solve this part of the equation, the diffusion reaction part calculate C everywhere, calculate gradient of C in the lateral direction and basically use that to incorporate a slip velocity boundary condition at any given point on the surface by essentially using the tangential component, so if n is the normal vector at that point, using the tangential component of the gradient on the surface and multiplying that by this mobility which we calculated, um, so I call this mobility which is essentially a, a, an Anzager uh, type response function uh, or response coefficient essentially connects fluxes uh, so in this case the tangential gradient of um, concentration to uh, this uh, quantity of interest here for the fluid uh, which is velocity um, so with these two with mobility and activity, I can fully specify uh, the uh, dynamics of the system. Um, for example, I can solve for the whole uh, uh, hydrodynamics if I want, or just calculate, let's say, the uh, propulsion velocity by, let's say, if it's a sphere, by having this kind of expression that we saw. Uh, 
So importantly, I want to keep mu and alpha uh, arbitrary. Basically, this will be the way I, I try and design my uh, uh, micro swimmers to respond differently um, to the uh, interactions and to the external field. Um, if you go for uh, spherically, um, for axially symmetric uh, cases, um, you will be able to decompose um, alpha and mu into these components. Um, then, for example, for a um, for a sphere, you can solve. For the concentration, this will be given by uh, the following solution. Um, so you can recognize uh, this expression as um, basically components coming from the generic solution of uh, Laplace equation in spherical coordinates with axial symmetry. Uh, you don't want the terms that grow with R. Um, and there is no externally imposed gradient. Uh, the gradient is imposed internally, and that's why you have the alpha there. And you can show that this solution will satisfy the condition that normally, uh, on the surface, the flux of the particles will be basically controlled by alpha. Okay. Then, knowing that, you can take the uh, gradient. Yes, ah. uh, you can take the gradient with in the lateral direction and uh, calculate the um, Okay, is it better? Yes. Uh, no, I don't know what happened. Um, so, um, if you look at this structure, uh, different modes of harmonics of the mobility and the activity are coupled to one another. So you can say, um, I will use this expression to basically find out the minimal conditions for having self-propulsion. Uh, in the case of a sphere, for example, uh, you realize that you need to have uh, at the lowest order um, some um, asymmetry. Actually, this will be uh, easier if I if I give you examples. So suppose I uh, look at a Janus particle where basically um, here I will have some coating, um, and then at the lower hemisphere, I will have another coating. 
so suppose it's polystyrene and then I coat it with platinum, right? It's plastic and I coat it with metal. The platinum will provide reactivity when you put it in a solution of hydrogen peroxide um, and the plastic doesn't have any reactivity with hydrogen peroxide, but also the platinum will interact differently with hydrogen peroxide. Uh, so this is um, the simplest uh, system that I can have. Um, So as you can see, um, somehow I need a symmetry uh, from the activity component, but it turns out that there is no necessity in terms of having a symmetry in the mobility component. Uh, this is a special case. It, it's the case for the, uh, for the sphere. Uh, if you look at other geometries, for example, ellipsoids, rods, um, disks have been looked at as well as objects of this shape. Um, then it turns out that the necessary condition to have self-propulsion um, is a lot more relaxed when you don't have uh, spherical symmetry. For example, uh, with the case of rods and, and ellipsoids, um, you can also have propulsion if activity is uniform, but mobility uh, breaks the symmetry. Um, in the case of uh, um, objects that have uh, basically a four aft asymmetry in the shape but still axially symmetric it turns out that uniform activity and mobility but just because of the shape could lead to self-propulsion um, so the simplicity of of the the scheme will allow you to to try different things you can also calculate the angular velocities uh, if there is an um, asymmetric elements uh, uh, for example you can have uh, you can have a boundary which is uh, like that uh, if you can do your platinum coating and then you start seeing or, or have a little bit of uh, uh, yeah any asymmetry basically will give you a spin component also in the uh, so spontaneous angular uh, velocity uh, which you can uh, look into okay um, so essentially uh, this makes um, an interesting example of what is in the in the Parisian circle known as the Curie principle uh, so that's basically the principle that if you have a symmetry of some sort and you derive uh, you drive the system um, away from equilibrium you expect to have motion unless something special happens and you don't have motion. Uh, and here there are subtleties in terms of what exactly constitutes the necessary asymmetry that you need to have, but that depends on the geometry and so on. But then in, in general, when you have a sufficiently asymmetric case and you drive the system away from equilibrium, you basically expect motion. Um, and again, I emphasize this is interesting because it provides a mechanism for self-propulsion. So if you uh, 
if you think about it, somehow we are contradicting this image that we have since high school that we cannot, uh, you know, grab on our, our on or our own arms or, 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 or hands and pull ourselves somehow because these are internal forces. Um, however, this is a different world. It's not the initial world. It's the coupling to the viscous hydrodynamics that will allow the system uh, essentially by using these internal forces to, to generate uh, self-propulsion. Um, next thing I want to look at, which will be tomorrow, um, is the stochastic dynamics of these Janus particles that are catalytic. Uh, uh, there are many different uh, aspects coming from the dynamics, uh, including anomalous dynamics and so on, uh, super diffusive behavior. Uh, there are several time scales in the system. Um, and then uh, from there, we will basically um, continue. So if there are any questions, uh, I'm happy to discuss that. Otherwise, it's...